So first of all, let me uh, give a warm thank you to Professor Simon Mariakov for organizing this event and also for fantastic hos uh, hospitality of this university. So, Herr Rector, thank you very much. I had a wonderful time here and my study was really enjoyable. Uh, so, it's time to begin with the lecture. I know it's late, but I do hope you will join me in this event. So, the project, as Professor Kopf has mentioned, is titled The Dynamic Theodicy Model, Understanding God, Evil, and Evolution. Together with Professor Piotr Roszczak from Torun in Poland, we are leading this project that is funded by the Oxford University and the John Templeton Foundation. And this is also our web page, so you can check it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. So, the topic. Pain always seems like a problem, but usually it is part of the solution. This was a quote from Nesse and Shulkin. So the experience of pain and suffering is familiar to almost all members of humanity. Pain overwhelms our bodies, our consciousness, changes the way we are in the world, the way we treat ourselves and others. It also changes our relationship with God. Pain and suffering often motivate people to pray hoping for healing and deliverance from pain. But it can also arouse anger toward the indifferent God. Theological and philosophical reflections on the nature of evil are influenced by understanding of the phenomena of pain and suffering. But often we find authors reflecting only on suffering as such. Pain hurts. And it is almost as we are in a state we should not be in. It is as we are in a state of punishment, even though we may not be guilty, as we do not deserve to be so fragile. Andrew Pinsent puts it beautifully, quoting, we are not what we should be, end of quote. On the other hand, there is a very known attitude, also expressed by St. Thomas Aquinas, that physical pain can lead to strengthening of the soul and the virtues, even if pain is more palpable and obvious to human reason than the joy of virtue. So, we open the, uh, today's lecture with the words of the American physician, Randolph Nesse, the founder of evolutionary medicine, who announced a different view of the phenomenon of pain. And so, if pain is shaped by the evolutionary development of living beings, in what way can this insight inform theodicy and theology? So, the plan is the following. After a short theological and theodician introduction, an introduction to the evolutionary medicine, we will attempt to provide a definition of pain, how pain is triggered in the human body, how pain is studied in animals. This will give us an evolutionary insight into development of pain in the living beings. Then we will try to see how theology and theodicy can benefit from the insights of biology and evolutionary medicine into the dimension of pain. So, step one, a short theological and theodician introduction. This is more of justification of the theme of why I'm doing this theme at all as part of this project. So, the tradition of theological reflection on the human condition, which inevitably includes pain, suffering, and death, abounds with attempts to make sense of these conditions. Together with the degree of suffering and the context of the concrete situation, the severity of pain is the fundamental moment by which we evaluate the gravity of the evil, of the injustice, the crime, the injury that a living being endures. The phenomenon of pain is therefore inseparable from theological and theodician reflections on the human condition, God and evil. We cannot go into detail about the theological foundations of these concepts here. 
However, we can point out some important moments of these foundations. Challenged by human frailty and the inevitability of pain and suffering, Christian re theological reflection turns to Jesus, who experienced great physical pain, but also emotional pain, and that on the cross. At the same time, those under the cross experienced emotional suffering and pain, like his mother Mary and Mary Magdalene, as we read in Mark chapter 15. Jesus, we read in John, first chapter, verse 29, we read that Jesus was the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world through his pain and death. But why sin, pain, and death in the world? According to the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and were expelled from Eden, from that perfect state that we intuitively believe was without pain and suffering. Since St. Paul and the fifth chapters of Romans, Adam is the one through whom mortality and sin became part of human condition. Hopes and prayers are directed toward the heavenly Jerusalem, where there will be no more pain and suffering, as we read in Revelation chapter 21. So Adam's free choice caused the fall, that is a rupture and alienation, both from the painless state that they were in and, more importantly, from God. Theology seeks to understand this alienation after the fall, which includes pain, as well as the relationship to pain, the meaning, the understanding, and the way to bear it. So just nota bene, my topic is not about the Adam and Eve's condition uh, existence uh, in Eden. I'm just using this as an example that is strongly connected with the notion of pain. So from a theological point of view, perhaps I am allowed to say that pain is an important factor in a dynamic relationship between a the past state of integrity and original holiness characterized by initially pain-free creation, B, the present state of sin, pain, and suffering, and C, the future state of the new heaven without the pain that the faithful invoke every time they pray our Father. So theological reflections confronted with the modern findings of genetics and evolutionary theory reflect these moments and try to understand the pain and suffering of living beings even before the appearance of human beings, but also the palpable evil that exists with the appearance of human beings until today. In the, in the plethora of views and given to close relationship of pain and suffering, it is understandable then to encounter everyday views that proclaim pain and human frailty as a kind of punishment, a kind of abandoning one by God, especially if the faithful think that God likes to take revenge, then they consider the cross they need to bear for higher purpose. And for some, even pain is the inheritance of Adam's disobedience. But is this the right category for the phenomenon of pain? Is pain, as part of human condition and imperfection, a punishment? Theodosy, a term coined by Leibniz at the beginning of 18th century, is a discipline that grew out of the human desire to argue for an omnipotent and morally perfect God in the face of natural and moral evil in the world. The humans and some other animals feel pain, and that is considered prima facie as a bad thing that raises the problem of evil. However, there are cases where enduring pain is voluntary and therefore not bad per se, such as painful training by professional athletes. Elena or Stamp therefore points out that, quoting, pain is not necessary for something to be an evil which human beings suffer, end of quote. Therefore, she considers that suffering is the topic we should be studying, not pain as such. Also, another expert in the field of theodicy, as such as, for instance, Christopher Southgate, also considers that pain is not a topic for theodicy, but suffering is. So, it seems that the emphasis is on the moment of suffering, while physical pain is primarily placed in the realm of bio biomedical phenomenon that can be eliminated to some degree. 
So are we talking about the wrong phenomenon tonight? Perhaps we should be talking about suffering. Nevertheless, in the next chapters, I will try an attempt to provide insights that point to the mind-body dualism that causes unclear and often oversimplistic divisions between pain as a physiological sensation and suffering as a psychological response to pain. For example, one of these studies that is clearly pointing out that there is no clear divide between the two, the study shows that unwanted breakups with partners cause emotional pain or suffering that activate the same neural architecture as when we feel physical pain, showing just how connected the two phenomena are on biological level. Furthermore, could it be that pain is fundamental phenomenon of the human condition and a basis for most kinds of suffering experiences? Or are we perhaps dealing with the paradox of inseparability of pain and suffering? Pain is, in most of the cases, the first and immediate sign of possible evil suffered by a living being. Following Levinas, we could say that human face opens the otherwise closed world of others and points to the pain that dominates the organism. Perhaps we could say that without pain, there would be no need for theodicy. Pain and suffering are two terms that are often used synonymously in the literature, and their distinction is anything but clear, if possible at all. This lecture is not about distinguishing so much between the pain and suffering, nor is the aim of this paper to dwell deeper into the layering of the phenomena of suffering as such. The goal is a better understanding of phenomena of pain. Now, given the multidimensional nature of pain, as we will see, we need an interdisciplinary approach for a better understanding of pain in its role in human condition. So in the following chapters and steps, we will shed light on some of the insights from the perspective of biology and evolutionary medicine on the topic of pain, and to consider how these insights can help the Odyssey and theology. So, evolutionary medicine and pain. Evolutionary theory, like uh, universal acid, as Dennett put it, spills over into all fields and enters into them, changing them, transforming them, so even medicine and religion. So, evolutionary medicine is the field that uses the principles of evolutionary biology to better combat disease. By looking at the body and diseases through an evolutionary lens, scientists hope that, quote in esse, diseases will make more and more sense, end of quote, which will help society with prevention and treatment. One of the topics in the field of evolutionary medicine is pain, which is viewed in the context of the evolution of life. Building on the biological perspective of pain, Researchers are looking at the mechanisms and functions of pain from an evolutionary perspective. This approach leads to the questions such as, how and by what mechanisms the sensation of pain arises in living things? Which species are able to feel pain? How the ability to feel pain leads to selective benefits and so on. And another important question is, why does pain hurt. Namely, why does not, let's say, a teeth just send a signal to our brain that something is going wrong? Why does it have to hurt so much, right, to detach you from your studies at all? So today we have, quoting Nessa Shulkin, a rich body of knowledge that describes the mechanisms that mediate and regulate pain at levels, from genes to molecules to tissues and organs, end of quote. Yet the question of which areas of the brain are responsible for pain is still a hotly debated topic, meaning that we are still not quite sure what regions are part of the pain matrix in our brain. So in the evolutionary framework, scientists are gaining 
more and more information about the evolution of mechanisms and behaviors related to pain, but they are still far from a decisive answer. In the following sections, we will try briefly now to discuss the definition of pain and then look at pain in humans and other living things. So the definition of pain is an ancient aporia that arose from the ancient Greek's dualistic view of the human being as a unity consisting of soul and body. Hence, the definition had it many twists and turns between pain as an emotion and pain as a sensation throughout the history of Western thinking. We will now discuss a, a more recent definition of pain by the International Association for the Study of Pain, which defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage, end of quote. This is definition that was, public, uh, that was published three years ago. So it is clear from the definition that it is recognized how pain has two sides, a physical sensation and an emotional experience, which may precede pain as an altruistic feature or as a consequence. The definition is further clarified by addition of six key points. So please follow me through them just quickly. It is stated that the pain is a personal experience and that the other factors, biological, psychological, and social, contribute to this phenomenon. In addition, pain is distinguished from nociception in order to avoid reducing it to the sensory perception. Nevertheless, the activity of nociception is usually the trigger for pain, while its amplification increases pain. As it is a personal experience, pain is something that is learned through experience, and subjective experience should be respected when talking about pain. So some of you will maybe be okay with a needle when taking out your blood, and some of you will be passed out. It's just the, your subjective perspective of the feeling of pain when you get a needle in your hand. From an evolutionary perspective, it is considered an adaptation, but in certain cases, it can be maladaptive, meaning it has gone wrong. It has a negative impact on well-being, not anymore supporting its survival. Although people can usually give verbal feedback, this is only one way of describing it. This means that there are other behaviors that can indicate the experience of pain in living organisms, including other creatures. Although the definition seems broad, there are additional warnings after it was published that pain is still not well defined because the focus is mostly on sensory and emotional features, while important cognitive and social features are not emphasized enough. Another problem is that the language of pain is still shaped by the dualistic anthropology that divides pain into the realm, realms of body and mind. Pain in body. So we have seen that pain is a layered phenomenon, but also noted that, quoting Fillingham, the experience of pain is characterized by tremendous inter-individual variability, which is driven, driven by multiple biopsychosocial factors, end of quote. Now, these biopsychosocial factors are emphasized in the biopsychosocial model of pain, where social factors also play a role, not just brain and mind. People understand themselves, for example, as members of society, so they could also experience pain, for example, when they lose their status or receive stigma or have their hearts broken or are exploited or experience social trauma. The experience of pain also changes at different levels as people develop from birth to adulthood, and the management or control of pain varies between people. Leaving the subjective and social dimensions of pain aside as much as possible for the moment, 
we are now interested in how the sensation of pain is triggered in the human body. We are now in the realm of the biomedical model, where pain is, quoting, an expression of discoverable disease processes and that there is a reliable connection between pathological changes and clinical features. <clears throat> this is a quote by Quinter et al., meaning pain is just something that is leading us to some certain cause in the human body which we need to detect. It's like a kind of a symptom, al alarm. So, how does it work? Receptors in the body perceive, transmit, and encode information from our body and the external environment, all of our receptors. This ability is called sensation. So, a nice chunk of the brain is responsible for these functions. The perception of painful stimuli is based on specific receptors and pathways that is, called, that is called nociception, Latin nocere, to harm. The neural endings that trigger the sensation of pain are, are called nociceptors. For example, the receptors on the surface of the skin perceive impacts from various possible sources. Something sharp touches and cuts the skin. Our fingers touch hot oven. A strong hand presses our hand any kind of stimulus that at least slightly damages the tissue physically or chemically. In that moment, certain substances leak out of the damaged cells, causing an electric current, which is then conducted further back to the spinal cord. From there, simply put, the signal raises to the thalamus in the central part of the brain and from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex. The signal that is traveling up to the cortex, causes different brain centers to be activated, which can, but doesn't have to, cause the sensation or feeling of pain. Okay, something, I'm in pain now. Okay. Because the brain contains maps of the entire body, we can qu quickly find out where the damage is occurring, where it hurts. <clears throat> and there are people with pain deficiency who cannot feel pain, causing them to accumulate more and more tissue damage. Unfortunately, these people have a much shorter life expectancy. So, <clears throat> although often unpleasant, pain warns us that our bodies are in danger and can thus save our lives. At the same time, we learn and remember dangerous and painful situations. We can adjust our motivation and avoid this situation in the future. Our past experience of pain also influences the way we will experience and respond to similar pain stimuli. You could say that pain is the survival tool of life. And if we don't, we, and if we don't learn, then we will probably get extremely damaged again, as my son has drawn the picture. Pain in animals. So, we have seen the problem of defining pain. It seems that the emphasis is on the subjective experience that is homocentric, because subjective experience leads causally to the notions of selfhood and individuality that are reserved for the species homo. Moreover, subjective experience is primarily verbally mediated, and all other animals cannot verbally express their painful states. Of course, it is pointed out that there are other expressions of pain, but it is obvious that additional effort is needed to define pain in terms of all living organisms. Because the emphasis is on the subjective dimensions to some extent, we can say that, quoting Walters and Williams, eclipses the motivational function of pain that are key to an evolutionary understanding, end of quote. So basically, if you want to study pain, you cannot always be a kind of homocentric view. You can not always have a homocentric view on the things that you are trying to study. Given that most humans can give indirect information about the pain they feel, the question arises as to how pain is defined in relation to nonverbal animals. Walter and Williams claim that there are two approaches. The first one, that as assumes the conscious experience of pain 
as in animals, and then looks for strong evidence or strong analogies to humans. For example, that animals with large brains are likely to feel pain. And the second approach is that looks for analogous functional properties, protective and motivational, for example, in invertebrates. <clears throat> Sorry. So how is pain studied in animals? To find out whether animals feel pain, scientists conduct comparative studies at different levels, anatomical, chemical, behavior, and motiv motivational. The question of pain in animals is important because it affects how we treat them. Even in, by the end of 18th century, Jeremy Bethem addresses the question of our treatment of animals in these words. Quoting, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer, end of quote. So what do we know today about animal pain? Today we know that mammals, quoting Al Weiler, process the neuroanatomic and neuropharmacologic components involved in transduction, transmission, and perception of noxious stimuli, end of quote. Sorry for all the medical terms. Therefore, it can be assumes, assumed, given the physical and chemical properties of mammals, that mammals can feel pain. Furthermore, certain fish species, for example, rainbow trout, possess a nociceptive system whose biology is, quoting Snedon, strikingly similar to that found in mammals. Rainbow trout responded physiologically and behaviorally to noxious stimuli, leading some scientists to recognize this as sufficient evidence for the experience of pain in fish. From an evolutionary perspective, fishes are interesting because, again, quantic Snedon, phylogenetically, fishes are the closest vertebrate groups to invertebrates and gave rise to vertebrate tetrapods. And therefore, studies from this field might discover the extent of evolutionary conservation or differences in the underlying mechanisms through the whole animal behavior responses to pain." End of quote. It will get less and less medical terms as we move on. However, other scientists argue that the condition for feeling pain is phenomenal, phenomenal consciousness. Unlike mammals and birds, fish do not have the neural ar architecture for phenomenal consciousness and therefore do not feel pain, it is claimed. So to avoid contemporary tendencies to reduce almost, almost all aspects of living beings to the brain and against the type of the argument, no cortex, no cry, Various counter-arguments have been developed, such as multiple realization argument by Michael, which claims that pain might be realized differently in humans and other creatures. Moving on to invertebrates. There, the subjective issues are completely set aside and pain is defined on the basis of functional properties. So basically, the greatest insights can be gained from observing the organism's behavior when confronted with noxious stimuli that might indicate the experience of pain. For example, cephalopods like octopuses, decapods like crabs and lobsters, and insects right, like drosophilia or fruit fly, bees, and so on. The results of studies conducted with octopuses led to the conclusion that they have sentience, are likely to feel pain, and have the ability to suffer. That's why the law was changed in the UK recently. Also concerning crabs and lobsters, it is found out that they have complex brain, but the presence of nociceptors is still a question to be answered, and that they can detect extreme heat. <clears throat> I don't know if you saw videos of these fishermen boiling live catch they had that morning, and you can see the animals running away, trying to escape, meaning that they do feel pain of boiling water. Concerning insects, well, 
they are just mixed results at this moment and nothing conclusive. In addition, these studies may also point to the realization that pain in animals may be perceived in ways that we humans are not aware of and elicit behaviors we are not similar to ours. One example, paramecium is a single-celled organism. It has no cent central nervous system, but in the face of danger, it can exhibit behaviors associated with pain, such as defense or avoidance response, which is why paramecium is sometimes called a swimming neuron. Now, following the before-mentioned multiple realization argument, Michael makes a nice point that, quoting, it could be that paramecia realize pain in a yet unknown way, end of quote. Of course, the important study of pain in animals, or also known as the animal sentience, is gaining momentum with many unanswered questions and influencing various fields, from science to ethical questions of the moral status of animals. This has also implications for theodicy, which not only thinks about human pain and suffering, but now recently also includes or reflects on animals like Georg Gasser or plants like, like Strickland. And coming to a conclusion from, from this part, pain as an old system of the living organisms. The above studies are only a small part of the growing body of evidence indicating increased complexity in the nature of pain experience as species evolved. Given the complexity of the social context of human condition and the multidimensionality of human existence, pain experience has clearly peaked in the human species. According to Broom, pain is an old system and its evolutionary path quoting him, must have involved cell sensitivity and localized responses, but substantial changes in efficacy could occur once efficient communication within the individual and sophisticated brain analysis could occur. Changes in the pain system, once there was a moderately complex brain, may well have been slight. Pain offered several evolutionary advantages. If a particular situation is harmful to the organism, it can action to avoid it, and the organism can learn to avoid future similar situations. The pain system in all vertebrates, which includes humans, has more similarities than differences, but according to Broom, they differ in behavioral responses to pain, which vary adaptively according to the way of life. End of quote. And now we come to the synthesis. Physical pain, theology, and theodicy. So what can theology and theodicy learn from biological and evolutionary medicine perspective on pain? We had a brief glimpse of the evolutionary part of pain from the single cell organisms that avoids potentially dangerous substances to the complex human pain system. So humans are not the only ones among living things that feel pain. Pain is evolutionarily older than humans themselves. Pain is an important part of life because it contributes to the survival of living beings. So from this point of view, pain did not come into the world with Adam and Eve, nor is it a consequence of their misbehavior in Eden. Given a lack of expertise, sorry for that, in theological considerations, allow here a simple example of possible integration of the previously stated insights with the thought of, with the thought of Thomas Aquinas. So I emphasize that I'm not developing Aquinas thought in depth here, but only trying to provide an example. So according to Thomas Aquinas, Adam's body in Eden, in the state of innocence, was ontologically the same as the body of contemporary humans. The nature of Adam and the nature of contemporary humans are the same. For example, Adam slept in Eden because sleep is a natural need of the body. Now this raises a question. 
Was Adam able to feel the pain in Eden? What would happen if God overrode the sensation of pain? The entire human body is in some way sensitive to the noxious stimuli, from the skin to the various brain centers involved. And also, there are numerous cognitive features that kick in, such as cognitive awareness, memory, reflection, and so on, when we are experiencing pain. Therefore, perhaps a more likely solution for those thinking about the pain-free state of Eden would be an environmental condition in Eden that posed no risk of major physical injury. According to Professor Piotr Roszczak, Aquinas would also support the idea that the external environment would have caused Adam pain or suffering, would not have caused, sorry, Adam pain or suffering. The abolition of nociception and the feeling of pain would affect the functioning and the whole nature of the human body, if we can then call it human at all. Of course, anything is possible to omnipotent God, but why would he create human nature as it is and then suspend it to such a great extent? One could argue that God could suspend the sensation of pain, but that at the same time he could not also suspend nociception. This would again mean the sus suspension of, for example, mainly brain structures, which could lead to collateral damage, since the same brain areas perform different tasks and functions. Therefore, it might be more reasonable to follow Aquinas and consider Adam and Eve to be of the same nature as us, while the environment in Eden poses not, no treat threat to their body, bodily integrity and saves them from the feeling of pain that might diminish the joy and love caused by the presence of God. If we now turn to our present state, we can ask the questions. Can the groaning of the whole creation in pains, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 22, be seen as a punishment for sin or in the category of natural evil. I believe not entirely, for we have seen that pain is part of the evolution of solution of living things, an evolutionary adaptation in an attempt to survive and secure the next generation. Physical pain as such has nothing glorious or tragic about it, and therefore cannot be placed under the concept of natural evil. As, we, as if we would say that our vestibular senses are part of natural evil. We could say that pain has value from a biological point of view. It has a positive value because it is necessary for survival. On the other hand, it has a negative value when it has a negative impact on body or social and psychological well-being for example, in chronic pain. So pain is not just a matter of sensation. It is a biological, psychological, and socially conditioned phenomenon. The, attempt, the attempts to make a clear-cut line in theodicy between physical pain and suffering owes its origins to the Greek dualism understanding of human nature, of humans as entity of two substances, of body and soul. It is still a feature of reflection in the field of theodicy that avoids speaking of pain as a fundamental topic of theodicy, as if it is downplayed because it is only a bodily reaction. Given the hard job and the fragility of the theodicy, and especially given its evolutionary recent twists or its reflections on animal and plant suffering, a theodicy that would take into account the pain in its full scope will surely be able to offer a better answer to the question of pain, suffering, and evil that accompany life from the beginnings. And a conclusion. Although the absence of pain is by no means the main goal of life after death, we believe that thanks to the evolutionary perspective of pain, we can better understand the intuitive longing of humanity and its hope for the final state when God will wipe all tears from our eyes. A pain-free state after death stands in supreme contrast to all the frictions of life that tries to avoid situations that cause pain.
from single cell organisms to humans. Thank you for your time. Thank <laughs> you.